ahead and get us started. Um, so I will say hello and good morning or good afternoon to those of you dialing in from Africa. Um, welcome to another grants and sponsored research initiative or GRIT seminar. Uh, my name is Teresa Betancourt. I'm a professor uh, at the Boston College School of Social Work and I direct the research program on children and adversity, which hosts this seminar as a part of our U19 Global Mental Health Scale-Up Hub. Uh, this seminar is also uh, co-hosted by other partners in those global hubs, um, including Essence and the Shine Hubs as well. Uh, as you know, our hub focuses on capacity building as well as a large scale-up study in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And we also do capacity building activities in Liberia. And now we're expanding to our new partners in Rwanda. We're very excited about that. Uh, so before I welcome today's speaker, I want to remind everyone to check out our website, follow us on Twitter and Facebook to stay updated on our programs, upcoming events, and available work opportunities. Um, because in Rwanda in particular, uh, our uh, implementation science project there to scale an evidence-based uh, family home visiting intervention to promote early childhood development and prevent violence. Um, which also includes a focus on father engagement and implementation science, is now expanding to over 10,000 children living in poverty um, in Rwanda and will be hiring in the months ahead. Uh, we have filled the Rwanda positions um, with FXB Rwanda, but we are hiring for Boston College staff to uh, be based eventually in Rwanda, but start remotely with onboarding from here. Um, and that means the digital here. And we have two master's level candidates and two PhD level um, openings with a real focus on implementation science, which is the focus of today's talk in the GRIT seminar. So now I'm gonna switch this over. Um, if you are not uh, on mute, please mute your phone. Uh, I'd like to introduce our GRIT speaker today, Dr. Laura Damschroeder. Uh, Dr. Damschroeder is a research investigator with the Veterans Administration, also called the VA in the United States, uh, at their Ann Arbor Center for Clinical Management Research, CCMR, and she's Implementation Research Coordinator with the uh, Veterans Administration Prove Query Program, which is a very well-known quality improvement initiative. She's an expert in the field of implementation science and is the lead developer and author of the widely used uh, implementation science framework called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CIFR, and I'm sure many of you have heard of this. It's one of the many out there to be thinking about and learning about, and so it's great to have her today. Dr. Damschroeder has worked on a wide range of topics, but most of her work is focused on U.S. veteran populations, uh, especially behavior change and preventative interventions, um, many with veterans inside and outside of the VA. Um, she's also adjunct assistant professor of the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia, and we're honored to have her today to discuss the use of theoretical frameworks in implementation research. So I'll turn it over to you, Laura. Are you all there? I don't hear Laura. I forgot to unmute myself. Okay, so <laughs> good morning. <laughs> I am so glad to um, hear of the diversity in the audience um, today. It looks like there are a couple of dozen people or maybe more. Um, I do see that there is a raise hand feature. Um, and so please feel free to raise your hand and also put questions in the chat. I am happy, um, I don't know, Teresa, or if you or Katie or someone can kind of monitor that for me. And yes, Tesla and Katie are on it, don't worry. Awesome, awesome. Um, and I would be, uh, feel free to interrupt me if there are questions of clarification that would be helpful to pause and address as I go. Um, but as questions arise, please do put them in and I'm, happy to address them. Um, I, hope that, I hope to take up only about a half an hour, maybe a little bit more, so that we can have plenty of time for conversation. Um, I just want to say that I'm only going to be able to, to touch the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that, is, uh, that I cannot talk about today because of time limitations, but I hope to at least just give you a taste. Um, and for even those of you who are familiar with the CIFR or using theoretical frameworks in, to help guide your work, that you'll come away with new ideas. 
and, um, and new confidence maybe in some areas. And then those of you who are brand new, I'm hoping that you'll at least get a taste and um, a way, a, a place to start, a place to get you started. Um, more and more, there are new resources that are being published, um, both in, in uh, peer-reviewed literature and also online. So um, you're really coming in at a good time. So I'm going to talk about use of theoretical frameworks in implementation research. Um, specifically, I will talk about the CFIR, the CFIR, or Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. I hope you're at least familiar with that, but I will provide an overview of the framework and then also um, into our website that we have online that's all freely available um, to provide technical assistance for people applying this particular framework. One of the things that I want to say right at the outset is I do not advocate the CFER for everything. It is not the only framework. It is not even the only best framework. <laughs> it, is, um, it is helpful in certain situations. It is helpful if it um, resonates with you and helps to bring clarity to your work. But there are also a lot of other frameworks out there. Normalization process theory, um, the Paris framework, um, uh, EPIS, E-P-I-S, all kinds of frameworks with all kinds of acronyms. <laughs> um, but the key is that you choose one that works for you, that brings clarity to your work and helps you to build understanding and knowledge. The principles of how to apply a framework all apply, even though I'm using the CFER to show and to demonstrate, all of these same principles can be used with a number of other frameworks as well. Um, so I don't want to at all convey that, you know, the CFER is the only answer. Um, a lot of this work that I'm presenting today is funded by my uh, main place of work, which is within Veterans Affairs. This is a, um, I'm basically an embedded researcher within a very large health system within the United States. It is the wow. single largest integrated health system in the country. Um, it's, uh, uh, we serve 6 million um, veterans of um, conflicts and wars. Uh, and um, yeah, I guess that's all that I will say. It gives us um, lots of opportunity to improve healthcare. I'm going to talk about applying theory in implementation research. I'm going to provide an application of the CFER, and actually, I'm not going to be able to really the second case, but I'll just touch on it briefly. So within implementation research, and many of you, I, I'm guessing, probably live this literally, <laughs> is that we have scientific goals where we want to build knowledge in a systematic way and in a way that we can share with one another. But then there's also the practical or the praxis of um, conducting this kind of research. We very much want to develop tools and approaches for practitioners to use, not just researchers, but people out in the field to identify effective strategies and to build a culture of learning within health systems. Um, and so this, I think, you know, this is a very practical um, applied science. Um, so the power of theory, even in the messy world that we live in, in you know, trying to do this kind of research, using organizing frameworks, theories, models. Today, I'm going to focus on frameworks, but frameworks are just one way to encapsulate theory and bring it into our work in a transparent, explicit way. One of the things that frameworks bring to the table for us is common terms and definitions. It brings a common language. So that if I'm using the CFER in my work here in the United States, 
and I'm using language like leadership engagement or goals and feedback or networks and communications, those terms are very specifically defined. And you can see from my qualitative data and my findings, and you can read about that using this language and see how it applies to your own work. And so because we have a common language, we can, um, we can talk, we can, we can share, we can build on one another's findings. And this is a very important foundational um, capability that uh, we need this in order to build measurement and to then predict using those measures and to be able to kind of improve our approaches and strategies. Um, and particularly in this kind of comp complex world that we're working in, it is especially important to use these frameworks consistently and integral to our work so that we can efficiently build collective knowledge. I'm going to just say a quick word about the concepts of validity. Um, often, randomized clinical trials are viewed as the gold standard for kind of proving that something works. We have an exponential growth in the number of trials that have been published showing what works, but it doesn't give us information about what, where it works and why and how we can maximize benefits from those interventions. So what randomized clinical trials give us is internal validity. It's very focused on the, on the pathway of change um, and it's very necessary to focus on internal validity so that we can establish causality. Implementation research, we don't want to ignore internal validity but we pay a lot more attention to external validity than randomized clinical trials. And this kind of knowledge is very important because this is what tells us how to get things implemented with the greatest or optimal benefit. So we know that there are persistent gaps in knowledge. Um, this is just one example. You could look up any Cochrane review or systematic review of a complex intervention. And you will, it will not give you any information. It will say, sometimes we get moderate effects. Sometimes we get small. Sometimes we get no effects. And we need to understand more about how we can get the maximum effects. Um, and we have very little information about that. We're getting a lot better in more recent years because of people like you. Um, but we still have a long way to go. This next slide just talks about complexity and the fact that we're dealing, this is, this is one conceptualization of all of the different dimensions of complexity that we're having to deal with and consider. Um, and without, I'm not going to go into this in detail, my slides are available to you in a PDF file. They will be shared, so you'll have this information and the resources. Um, so Per Nielsen um, published a paper that some of you, many of you hopefully are familiar with. This paper was really helpful in categorizing all of the different frameworks that are out there. There are over a hundred that have been included in recent reviews of all of the different frameworks. And how in the world do you make sense of all that? So this article um, was a first effort at categorizing frameworks, and I'll go into the different types of frameworks in a minute. I recently published a paper in psychiatry research that kind of takes um, peers' uh, uh, categories a step further. And what I attempt to do is to show how each of these um, types of frameworks can help to answer which types of questions. So. Um, one of the, uh, actually, I'm going to skip out really quick um, because I'm not using the right set of slides. I'm so sorry. Hang on, just give me a minute. Are there any um, <laughs> questions while I do this? Um, no, I think we can. Um, can you hear me, Laura? This is Teresa. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, I can hear you just fine. Um, so we use Epis because one of our major um, strategies for scaling and sustaining, and we have a very strong interest on the sustainment part in low resource settings, um, group cognitive behavioral therapy interventions in Sierra Leone. Um, so we've been using Epis um, and using the collaborative team approach as our strategy. Uh, that is an adaptation of the interagency collaborative team. Um, so just to give you a background, I think most people on the call are very familiar with EPIS. Um, some, you know, who are coming from different areas of implementation science have had the broader exposure to CIFR, to REAIM. Um, but this is an age-old struggle, and I think when it comes to the early childhood development people, um, there's been some struggle to get uh, them to think creatively about how to adapt existing implementation science frameworks rather than recreating new ones. And, and that's the age old joke about um, conceptual frameworks and implementation science that it's like a toothbrush. Everybody has one and doesn't want to use the other person. Um, so we're, we're in this situation of working with a lot of early childhood development um, researchers about going to scale. Uh, but uh, there's been some resistance to looking at the existing implementation science frameworks and thinking about how they could be adapted to that type of behavior change, which is about parenting. Um, yes. So that, that is an ongoing struggle we're having with some of our partners. So as you talking about different frameworks, if you have any thoughts on how behavior change can apply to something like parenting um, and early childhood development, that would yes. be super. Okay. Um, wonderful. That is a wonderful setup. And you should be able to see my slides now again. Um, so the, the C, for, well, okay. So I'm going to go through the different types of frameworks. Um, we have kind of a, a meta hypothesis within implementation science. We generally believe that we need to have inner innovations that actually work, that there is some proof that they work. We need to have implementation approaches to get those inner innovations in place. We need to assess implementation outcomes. These are outcomes that are much more proximal to the work that we're actually doing. And then when we have all, all three of those in place, then we can see impact, positive impact on health systems and clinical outcomes and patients. So what we know is that in the EPIS framework, I think would fit within, the EPIS framework actually addresses multiple types, um, but one is that it provides a process for thinking through your whole kind of life cycle of implementation, pre-implementation, active implementation, what are the things to do, um, to look forward into sustainability. We don't want just short-term success. We need to ensure long-term success. And sustainability is a whole nother topic. And I know that I, in my own work, am pay likewise paying attention to sustainability and recognizing the importance of continuing to engage local teams in continued optimization even after our initial implementation efforts have completed. Um, another a second category of frameworks are evaluation frameworks and these give us ideas for the types of outcomes, multi-dimensional outcomes that we need to pay attention to. And then there we recognize that all of this very kind of simplistic pathway is happening within context of individuals. And in your case, you, you've got families, you have parents, you have children, um, but who are the people who are actually delivering the intervention? Um, I have collaborated with researchers working with parents and families, like in a reading initiative. A lot of my own work is in implementing behavior change um, interventions, specifically with lifestyle, mm -hmm. physical activity, weight loss. So I understand the enormous challenges of implementing behavior change that are emanating from all kinds of um, levels. Um, and yeah. I think that regardless of the framework that you're using, it's important to conceptualize, um, you know, who are the individuals involved? Is it the parents? Maybe there are two tiers of 
of people involved. You need to conceptualize the parent parental role and you need to conceptualize maybe it's community health workers or if it's a local health clinic or a school, um, but what those units of analyses are and how they contribute to your ability to then impact um, you know, the children that you're hoping to make a difference. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have many constructs that are, um, are influences that are coming from the inner setting. And this is where it's really important. And you may have more than one organization or more than one conceptualization of unit of analysis. So maybe the inner setting is a family. What are the family dynamics? What are you know, and that's, you know, every, I, I, very different than what the CFER talks about. But if you take a step out, if it's the schools that are kind of reaching out to parents, if it's the a health clinic or, you know, some kind of community entity that's reaching out to parents, what are those factors and influences? Um, the CFER specifically is very much oriented toward clinical settings. So it talks about things like leadership engagement that may or may not be um, salient for you. But on the other hand, there are opinion leaders, there are networks of working relationships like between community health workers and teachers or physicians or nurses or social workers or you know whoever those people are. Um, the influences of the strength and the nature of those communication and networking um, or relational kind of, you know, uh, um, facets are important to consider. Um, and yeah. then there are factors in the outer setting. So someone talked about, a, you know, corrupt governments, um, incentives that are either disincentives or positive incentives. Um, what are these pressures that are kind of coming in? Maybe there's issues with the logistics and the supply chain, um, you know, if you need supplies or equipment, um, but all of those coming in from the outer setting. And so what um, the CFER is a determinant type of framework and the EPIS also has facets of determinant um, framework as well. So it's both a process in that here are the stages of implementation, but then also um, I think it gets down to here are factors that you need to pay attention to at each of the levels. What the CFER can do, and this is where you think about, okay, what, to the, uh, what about the EPIS really works for me? Well, there may be parts of the EPIS that are not kind of as well spelled out as you know and you can look at a framework like the CFER that can explicate or explain or define factors more explicitly than maybe other frameworks do so you could combine any of the constructs that you see in the CFER that work for you that really resonate um, and combine those with your use of the EPIS framework and that's okay and the feedback that we get right. about, hey, this construct, I used it in this way. Like, for example, leadership engagement. We may have defined it in terms of, I don't know, hierarchical, lead, you know, it, it, I mean, we have a very loose definition of what a leader is, but we mostly are very focused on leaders within healthcare organizations. Your leaders may be, you know, village leaders, maybe town leaders, maybe, you know, um, a social worker supervisor. Um, and so it may be a more diffuse organization. So you take the concept of leadership engagement and you operationalize it in a way that works for you. And then you, when you publish your findings, be really clear about this is how we operationalize the idea of leadership engagement. And we found that that is really important in our work that having leaders engaged defined in this way really matters if they're not engaged or if they're resistant then implementation is not going to be successful and you may find that 
Um, okay, so that's, that's just fair. kind of an example, an off-the-cuff example of how you could consider kind of pieces and parts of frameworks that have been published. Um, right. Rather than reinventing new things. Um, so there are, like I said earlier, there are more and more published and available resources to give you guidance on using frameworks. Now, these approaches will not tell you how to combine pieces and parts of frameworks, but maybe you'll, you'll recognize that there are two or three different frameworks that might work for you and you can't really decide. So look at them all and pick out the pieces that work for you. Um, I, I think that I wouldn't be alone in saying that. There also is um, a newly published or newly available online resource um, that also walks you through step by step. Um, all right, so now I'm going to go through uh, a implementation of a telephone lifestyle coaching program, which is a behavior change program are aimed at improving lifestyle, these six topics at the top of the slide, most, th this was uh, targeted to veterans, adults, and uh, most of them chose to work on losing weight, so striving for a healthy weight. And then the second most common topic um, was being tobacco free or quitting smoking. There were 10 coaching calls with a, a, a good evidence base over 9,000 um, veterans patients were referred over a 19 month period, over half enrolled. So this was a very large pilot. I'm gonna skip over this study relatively quickly because I have um, spent some time uh, you know, thinking and reflecting on the uh, EPIS and, and et cetera, and it's already ha getting toward half past. But by all means, um, I'm gonna try the, to keep this conceptual and there's a lot of devil in the details. But this study was published, and I keep forgetting to put the citation in here, but it is published in Translational Behavioral Medicine. And it has a lot of appendices, and it has a lot of details about exactly how we did this study. Um, so what we found in this pilot was, starting on the left side of this graph, um, of course there were zero referrals because the program wasn't in place. For us, this was a relatively simple implementation, and I say that tongue in cheek because implementation is never simple. But all these facilities, all these clinics had to do was to find someone who could help refer patients who would benefit from this behavior change program. They were not delivering the intervention an outside vendor was delivering the intervention. So all they had to do was refer patients. And yet at the end of 19 months, so more than a year and a half, we found that the, the site with the highest rate of referrals had seven times more referrals than the sites who had the least number of referrals. So clearly, you know, we wanna be able to understand what were the barriers and the influences that helped some sites be so successful and other sites not. So our research question was, what are the barriers and facilitators to implementation? We conducted lots of interviews and uh, over 11 different clinics. Um, we did a mixed methods design. We use quantitative and qualitative data. Um, if you're not already familiar with our website, seeforguide.org, check it out, it's um, freely available and it gives you a lot of details about how to apply this framework. And again, the principles that we use can be used with any framework, including um, the EPIS. So our outcome was um, a, a measure of penetration. So in other words, the higher the rate of referrals of patients, the more robust the implementation. And this is an outcome that is very proximal, it's very close to the implementation efforts being made. So the you know, processes had to be redesigned and changed to get patients referred. And uh, though all those activities and all those strategies um, are best measured or, or assessed by looking at 
referral rates. So we were not looking at, for example, client outcomes, which are more distal, more, more you know, they're important to measure for system impact and <clears throat> hopefully positive impact on patients. Um, and for us, that would include things like uh, smoking cessation rates and weight loss. And uh, they found that based on self-reported data that there were significant um, improvements in both. But our focus in this study was just who, you know, just getting those referral rates. So I'm going to dance through the CIFR very quickly, but um, there are 39 constructs that are defined within the CIFR. They are organized across five different domains. The first domain is the intervention domain. And we use qualitative data. We do not have a whole slate of quantitative measures. Um, measuring these constructs uh, quantitatively is enormously challenging and there are not validated measures for doing this. And there are people who have looked and done massive literature reviews and pretty much come to the same conclusion. Um, so we are using quality, our past work has used qualitative data. Um, so this is just an example of a quote um, related to strength of perception of strength of evidence. So one of the things um, with this work, it is important to capture the perceptions of people. Um, we can say as researchers, I looked in the literature the evidence for this program is really quite strong. But if people at the local clinic don't believe in that and they don't think it's gonna work for their patients because their patients are so different, that's a big issue and we need to know about that. So that's why it's important even if we think the evidence is strong, we still need to ask actual um, practitioners what do they think of the evidence. Um, and we can get very different perceptions, even with the, exactly the same program, exactly the same kind of materials and resources and support, but get very different perceptions. The second main domain of the CIFR is characteristics of the individuals who will be delivering this intervention. Um, so here's an example of one person saying, oh, it won't work, okay? We need to know about those pockets of resistance. Is it physicians who believe that? Is it nurses? You know, where is it in the clinic? That definitely indicates that we would need to do some kind of a better engagement strategy. The third major domain is outer setting. And I wanna pause on this just for a minute because the outer setting is actually the least well-developed within the CIFR, especially for global health. And, um, uh, topics. Um, there was a paper just recently published by Valerie Ridd, R-I-D-D-E, -E, in BMJ Global Health. Um, it was just published, I don't know, a few weeks ago or something. And uh, she and her colleagues stepped through specifically for global health, um, applying and suggesting and recommending ways to apply um, frameworks within global health settings. Within the policy domain, um, there are things like payment um, policies, um, again, supply chain, uh, maybe community, um, you know, really strong community uh, dynamics that may work for or against you. These are not defined very well, if at all, in the CIFR. So this would be an area where you from your own knowledge or drawing from expanded literature, from global health, from policy, um, need to add additional constructs. And again, you can combine those with this framework or with another framework that you're using, but be really clear that you're doing that and where you're getting the additional topics from. The fourth domain is the inner setting. And for the CIFR, because it's so kind of organization and clinic focused, this is the best, most developed or most deeply developed domain. Um, and here we've got um, quite a number of constructs. One construct, for example, is compatibility. 
So it's, you know, what is the perception of the fit of the intervention with the local existing context? And I'll go through an example of that in just a minute here. I'm going to go on to the fifth domain of the CIFR, which is at the process. The CIFR is not, the CIFR does not prescribe how to do implementation. It just says we need to plan, we need to engage people, we need to execute, and we need to reflect and evaluate how we're doing. It doesn't tell you how to do that or which order. Um, there are other frameworks that get more specific, the EPIS, I think, being one. All right, I better move forward pretty quickly, but here's a uh, snapshot of our technical assistance website. We have an interview guide maker that allows you to just click on the uh, constructs that are important for you, and there are ways of identifying those, and it will output a fully formatted interview guide that you can use as a starting point and you can edit it in any way that you need, translate it, um, and, and you know you copy and paste it into Word and, um, and it gives you a starting point. What we did with our qualitative data is that we had a rating approach and again on our website and in our published papers we talk about how to do this, but what we want to do with like a, a concept like compatibility so, you know, with our telephone lifestyle coaching program, exactly the same program into the same system, and yet every clinic is so vastly different. Um, in one place, they had really serious um, compatibility issues that caused bottlenecks um, to really ratchet down um, their ability to refer patients. And so we gave them a strong negative barrier not just because of the single quote, but because of um, the, the mass of quotes that we got for this particular clinic. But then there was another clinic, again, same system, same program, and they had a really positive view of compatibility. And in this case, we gave it a strong positive, so a plus two um, facilitating influence of this particular construct. When we do this, we're able to create a matrix that has the sites, the clinics going across the top, and they're in order from the lowest rate of referrals to the highest rate of referrals. Um, and then we've got the CIFR constructs going down the left side of the table, and you can see all the minus twos, the plus ones, the minus ones. And then we did correlations, and we found which of the constructs were most strongly correlated with our outcomes. And we identified out of the list of constructs, we identified seven that were seen to be strongly distinguishing. In other words, these are constructs that we need to pay attention to. We need to figure out strategies to address them. And here's a table where we go back to our qualitative data for six of the seven um, constructs and uh, we explain qualitatively what does it look like as a facilitator what does it look like as a barrier and then that helps us to give insights about the highest versus the lowest refers now I'm just going to take this one step further very quickly once we have this information about context what do we do with it well we want to use this information to choose strategies to address them. There's a series of papers, uh, the ERIC uh, uh, list of strategies, implementation strategies. This is not the be all end all list. There are lots of, it's just a beginning point, but it does provide um, a comprehensive list of strategies to consider. And then we published a paper late last year that attempted to map which implementation strategies would address which of the CIFR barriers. So, um, and I will tell you, there was not a lot of consensus. And one of the reasons for the lack of consensus, we think, is that people were coming to the table, even, you know, if you say, oh, it's lack of compatibility. Well, why isn't it compatible? We still need more information. And people, when they said, well, this strategy would best address compatibility, they were making assumptions that are different um, than 
you know, across the board. We had a uh, hundred and almost 170 people who responded and they were from really all over the world. Um, so we have this kind of, you know, what tends to be a black box. Well, you know, I'm going to do this education strategy. Well, on the right side, intervention mapping is one way to help you think through, well, why are you choosing education? Why do you think education is going to work to solve a barrier? Um, and how are you going to operationalize that education? Is it a workshop? Is it a brochure? Is it online? Is it in print? Is it a person going out and giving a talk, et cetera? One of the things that I want to end with is to encourage you to critique whatever framework you're using, because if you don't do this, then we have nothing to go on to improve the framework and help advance our research. And so we very much look forward to people saying, well, the CIFR is pretty good this way, but it really has gaps here. We need to expand it here and add these constructs there. Um, we really need that kind of information. And these are just three examples. They're actually pretty rare. Um, there's a fourth one that I can think of as well. All right, I'm gonna stop. It's um, 41 after the hour. That gives us about almost 20 minutes to talk. Happy to take questions. Great, uh, thank you so much, Laura. This is uh, Tesla from the RPCA. I see a question in the chat um, from Tyrone Parchment. Um, he has two questions for you. The first being, uh, what languages are available for the CIFR guide on online? Um, and the second question is, what platform uh, do you recommend when analyzing the qualitative data when implementing CIFR? Um, so for the first question, we are happy to post um, translations of the CIFR. So far, we have a French translation available online. Um, we, I think there's a Chinese version that is on its way, um, but we haven't yet gotten it. Um, but I think, I think those are the only two that, I've, that I know of. But if you have a translation of the CIFR that has worked for you, please do share it with us. You can, um, there's a way of contacting us on the website or you can email me. Um, and so, you know, we welcome that. In terms of platform for doing qualitative work, we have used everything from just plain word and just kind of highlight passages and use comment bubbles to put codes in. That is not very um, efficient, um, but if you don't have the software available, um, that is, you can do that um, and it works. And also you can um, use Excel, um, just you know, kind of cutting paste and pasting uh, passages in and putting tags on them, which basically is all, what qualitative coding is all about. Um, we have used Envivo and we have Envivo templates online. I have a lot of colleagues that use Atlas TI. I think we're getting an Atlas TI template soon that someone is volunteering for us for the website. We have also used Deduce, which is an open systems um, qualitative software. And we have used that successfully on a, pro a, a few projects as well. So there are a lot of parameters, including cost and uh, security and firewalls and so forth to consider in choosing your platform for qualitative work. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, it looks like we have a, a hand up from Diego Suarez. Diego, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning, yes. Yes, excellent. I'm joining from the south of Mexico, from Chiapas. I'm an incoming MSW PhD student at BC. And I'm the director of Laboratorio Movimiento, and I'm currently developing an intervention with police commanders in several cities in Mexico to reduce their stress perception and increase uh, leadership engagement. Uh, my question especially relates to uh, the outer uh, setting. And 
it's basically, do you think, is there a conflict between the ethos of implementation science and the strict guidelines of institutional review boards? What I mean with this is uh, how we balance effective implementation with institutional metrics. This is especially important and difficult in contexts that are riddled by oppression, corruption, and indifference. And basically, I'm asking if there, are, if there are any needed transformations at the institutional review board level to advance rigorous but impactful science. I'm going to share my questions in the chat so it's clear where I'm going. Yeah, so um, those are very broad questions. I'm trying to get the chat open. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first of all, um, with respect to institutional review boards or ethics reviews, um, within my system, we are able to define quality improvement work that we conduct with the rigor of research. You know, we still write protocols for ourselves, et cetera. But because so much of our work is partnered with people who are actually leading the programs at either a local or national level, and they are completely on board with the need to evaluate and optimize their programs as a quality improvement effort. So a lot of my own work is actually exempt from IRB or ethics review. Um, I don't make that determination myself, but there are others and we have a process for doing so within our own system. So in terms of you know, going through ethics reviews, which can often put a real damper um, in terms of time delays and in terms of the rigidity sometimes that uh, board reviewers are looking for, you know, it's like, oh, you have to fully define your intervention up front, and this is exactly what you're going to do. But then we run into all of these changing dynamic scenarios. And not only that, we don't know exactly what is the best intervention until we do, until we work with, with people, and we know that we need to highly adapt and refine as we go. Um, our boards are getting better about that within the U.S. because they recognize the need to be responsive to the needs of local people. Um, but there are, you know, it was not always that way. When you've got more traditional interventionists or trialists who are reviewing your protocols, um, they have a hard time with the kind of work that we do. But I think emphasizing the need to generate the external validity versus internal and almost like teaching those re board reviewers um, where our emphasis is, um, I think will be helpful and you can help educate them over time. With respect to um, kind of the ethical issues that it appears that, you know, you're running into in terms of um, you know, I don't know exactly how it's manifesting in terms of the government, you know, the, the oppression, uh, questions of oppression it would be really interesting to, you know, kind of explore that a little more. Um, but I think to explicitly um, articulate, I guess, how that oppression manifests at the different levels. And if you are, you know, if it's, if it's, uh, yeah, it depends on, you know, who's, who's oppressing who and at what level. Um, and you talked about a stress reduction intervention. And if the oppression is a, um, a source of some of that stress, um, it sounds like maybe you're designing, um, you're designing interventions to help address um, that source as a source. I think the key is generally find simpatico, compatible uh, partners who absolutely are with you in what you want to do and let them help you with the language and how you articulate exactly the issues of oppression. Um, sometimes you have to be careful about, you know, how you 
um, and the assumptions that you make and the way that you describe it. Um, but if you frame it in a way that is acceptable and doesn't make, you know, the system defensive against it, um, you know, that would just be a starting point. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. And I see um, we've received one from Abhishek Singhe, part of the Essence Hub um, and implement Implementation Research Grant in India. Um, and they write, can CIFR domains and or constructs be used to assess the readiness to change before implementing any evidence-based intervention in a primary healthcare setting? Yes, the answer is yes. And um, you use the concept of readiness to change. Um, there are uh, measures of readiness for change. Um, Brian Weiner has one, Christian Halfridge has another. Um, I have debated um, over the years about where the concept of readiness for change lies. I think that what the CIFR does is it identifies contributors to readiness for change. So we do have uh, a, a construct with several subconstructs within the CIFR that is called readiness for implementation. And we have constructs related to leadership engagement, available resources, access to knowledge and information. Those are three uh, um, just very concrete things that we feel need to be in place for even considering or taking the first step toward implementation. Um, the other thing that we have found is that if you look at the process domain, um, if people are not um, engaged, they're not on board, you know, the engaging construct, if they are not, if they don't have data or measures available or some, you know, qualitative and quantitative, if they're not even paying attention at all to the topic as an issue, you know, the one that your whatever your primary care topic is, um, those would be important contributors or indicators of uh, implementation or a readiness as well. So I think the key is, I mean, the answer is yes, but you also have to be really clear about how you're articulating readiness um, for change and how you'll use the CIFR to um, kind of predict or identify low versus high readiness for change. So if you found, you know, like low leadership engagement, um, lack of available resources, lack of access to knowledge and information, that's one way that you can define readiness. But if you use Brian Weiner's definition of readiness, um, which is like collective confidence to make a change and collective um, uh, kind of will and motivation to make a change, um, then the CIFR might be used to help predict um, people's confidence and motivation to make a change. Because you can imagine that if there were high leadership engagement and um, readily available resources and knowledge and information supports all that were in place, then you would probably get high readiness for change. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm or comments? Can you hear me, Laura? Yes. Hi, it's Teresa again. Um, well, while we wait to see if there are any other questions on this topic of measurement of certain constructs within implementation science, like you talked about the two different scales looking at readiness for change, could you talk a little bit um, about measurement and um, what already are we seeing in implementation science that there are a lot of measures for certain critical constructs, but what are some constructs where there's still a lack of strong tools and they are challenging to measure, especially as you think about um, moving across different cultures? Uh, because certainly what leadership looks like um, in one culture to another could differ. 
Um, also, um, constructs like buy-in. So I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about what, what are we measuring well, what are we not measuring well quantitatively? Because I think qualitatively, it's a lot easier to do contextually, but I have a doctoral student interested in looking at some of the performance of quantitative um, tools within our sample in Sierra Leone. So if you could just give some thoughts on that, and what does that mean for moving across different cultures and contexts globally? So I'm going to frame, well, first of all, I'll give the bad news, then I'm going to give the good news. The bad news is that we're really not measuring much of anything well, even when we consider all of the plethora, the magnitude of research coming out of the U.S., we can't even measure things well in the U.S. Um, and uh, and, and, and there may be, you know, work that I'm not, maybe there are other countries in the world that are doing better than we are. Um, but the reviews that I know of that are international based on published work um, is pretty much true across the board. We are woefully um, weak in uh, measurement in these, uh, of these concepts. And I will say that for our own team, we've been working on trying to uh, develop practical, lay person, accessible measures of just 10 of the CIFR constructs. And it has taken us a long time um, to have some measures that maybe we're kind of ready to pilot and have some confidence in. I will say, okay, there are a couple of bright spots in this, and it's good that you're familiar with the EPIS, which comes out of Gregory Aaron's work and colleagues. He and his colleagues are, are you know, expanding and, and strengthening a tremendous network of researchers who are very much focused on the topic of measurement. They have published some really fabulous measures that have good validity. The thing I like about these measures is that they are very clear about the conceptual foundations before they go forth and measure. And then when they come out with the measures, they're very clear about what they're measuring and what they're not. And they have had some really fascinating studies, especially around the concepts of leadership. But their concept yeah. of leadership is not what you might see in a global setting. You know, it's more mm -hmm. institutional and US based for sure. Brian Weiner is another person to look for um, in his measures of, he has three uh, very practical measures, acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility, and very mm -hmm. clearly and deeply rooted in foundational concepts as well. The good news is that this gap means that you as kind of developing researchers are um, the, the, you've got a career in front of you. Um, but these are two people, Brian Weiner and Gregory Ahrens and colleagues, two groups that do a really great job with measure, measurement. Excellent, thank you. And I, I think that's a, a call to action for all of you calling in from Mexico, India, you know, different partners in Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Liberia, that there's a whole world out there to think about the fit and the assessment of these constructs qualitatively and quantitatively in your setting and, and the whole field to help develop. Great. Um, well, I think uh, we should probably wrap up there, right? Tessa, Katie, anything else burning before um, we wrap up? I think that's it. Thank you so much, Laura, 